My next guest is a U.S. senator from the state of New Jersey, one of seven senators running for president. He's also the former mayor of Newark, New Jersey, where he still lives. He's hoping a message of unity and equality will break through a crowded field and win him the nomination. Senator Booker, welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you. I've been following your career for a long time, and as a branding guy, I, it's interesting that I look at you, and I, I, I want to talk about the C word and the P word. And the C word is charisma which you've always had since you came on the scene. I mean, you, you know, you just have this kind of presence and magnetic, and that's always a wonderful word. But sometimes with you, I want to go to the P word, the policy word, it can overshadow. Yeah. I mean, what people sometimes don't realize, what you did, you did a real workman's job in Newark yeah. as far as affordable housing, as far as education, as far as crime. Sometimes I think the charisma overshadows the policy, correct? Yeah, I, I will actually give you, a, a, that's a fair reading. In Newark, I had a branding problem. Our, our city had a reputation of crime and corruption and decay. And so we just made a decision. We're going to have to try to bring the world's attention to Newark, put Newark on the map. And we found really creative ways, uh, battles with Conan O'Brien who insulted our city that became a national story. And those exploits became to overshadow the real management job we were doing, inheriting a city with a massive budget deficit, losing its tax base. So what I'm proud about is not that we brought attention to the city, but that the measurable indices of transformation are there. You know, we, you just told me a little fact off camera. I didn't know that you played tight end for Stanford yeah. under Denny Green. Yes. Billick was your, your position coach. Red Sox, last week, there was no glaring, more glaring symbol of what's wrong in this country as far as them going to the White House. A team divided. One of your strong suits and, and one of your uh, kind of uh, guiding forces behind the Criminal Reform Act is the way you worked across the aisle. You talked about working with the Koch brothers. You, you, you talked about working with Jared Kushner, welcoming Newt Gingrich to your office, Grover Nornquist. How important can that be as a centerpiece message? Because emotionally, I feel from people so much, even though it doesn't come as a strict policy point, it's just a very unnerving place we are right now. Well, I, I think we're slipping into tribalism as a country, and that is really dangerous when we have fear-based, zero-sum game, pit American against American politics. Uh, for me, I, I try to say this to my party. If, if, if we are going to win, we can't be about what we're against. We've got to be about what we're for. We can't be simply saying we're going to beat Republicans. This is a moment where we need to unite Americans, and that's got to be our message. The, it, it, you mentioned we can't just run against Republicans. And what, I have a theory. I want to bounce it off you that, and this is why I think Biden has, has jumped to such a lead, is that the visceral need to beat Trump Trump is going to transcend everything. It doesn't mean your message cannot just, it has to be beyond beat Trump. Yes. But tell me why you are the anti-Trump and articulate that in a very single-minded, this is why I am going to beat Trump. Because whether you guys want to re agree to it, not agree to it, if that message is not synthesized, you're not going to get it done. Well, I'm saying very directly to people, if, you, if your big aspiration is just to remove one guy in one office, then we are thinking too small. Are we though? Let, let me just push back yeah. for a second. If I go on the premise, this is my business ac acumen background coming forward, that in order to do everything else, if we can't do that, so yes, that is thinking small, but yeah. in order to think big, we yeah. first have to think that's the tactic that has to happen, otherwise we can't un open the dam. Well, I, I, again, if I, if I said to you that, hey, our, our, when we beat Notre Dame, when they were ranked number one in the country, when we were Stanford, if it said our goal is just to get one point more than them, no. Our well, I, what's at stake here is, uh, I think, our democracy. So it, well, more than that, more than that, our democracy. I mean, we, we could be the first generation of Americans to do worse than our parents. On, we are on, going on, to it, Yeah. We, so, well, I, I, don't, I don't accept but that. But I want to stay, but, uh, stay but, really focused on going after Because if I was managing your campaign, yeah. I would say that is what the people want to and see. I, and I would say to you what's responding to people out there is when I say, hey, the floor is beating Trump. To get into the game, you need to be able to say, I can beat Trump. But if that's that's where we stop. I believe we are best when we are aspirational, when we stand up and say, we're going to the moon. We're not just going to beat the Chinese to the moon or the Russians to the moon. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be the best there ever was. And so my message to people is the issues on my block as the only person running for office that lives in a low income, below the poverty line, tough neighborhood. My goal is not just to beat him, which we will, which I will. My goal is to get this country back to what our parents did, to get it back on the track of providing shared prosperity and justice for all. That's 
the aspiration. And by the way, that's going to excite a lot more people out there to the polls. Wow. We've been losing elections because folks haven't been coming out. I hear you. That's left brain stuff. I still, as a marker, to go left brain, right brain. I want to get to guns in a minute because yeah. I'm so impressed with what you're doing. Just one more thing on this whole Trump thing. I want to do, every time I, I interview a, a candidate, I want to do what I call a role play where I'm going to be Trump on stage because right. I, I always break it down to a mono, mono, mono woman, whatever it right, is. Right, right. And we know this is a dirty plays guy who plays dirty. So I'm going to be Trump. These are not my words. These are Trump words. I'm going to turn to you on stage and I'm going to say, a Spartacus guy, you know, liberal guy, you know, you want slavery reparations. He's from Newark. You know, the dog whistles will be in there. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's from Newark. He's a socialist. Uh, we're not ready. You know, you need a grown up who's turned the economy around and we'll let Spartacus stay in Newark. Now, before you respond, we know what's underneath all of that. Yeah, your turn. First of all, my turn is the way we beat bullies like you uh, was not by bringing uh, Bull Connor didn't fall by bringing bigger fire hoses and, and bigger dogs. America is tired of that toxicity. America doesn't want me to beat Trump down. I t a guy came up to me in Iowa and said, hey, I want you to punch Trump in the face. And I joke with him. I go, man, that's a felony. And us black guys, <laughs> us black guys, we don't get away with that that often. <laughs> Uh, uh, he's going to find out uh, when he it. has his six foot three former tight end on that debate stage with him. He's going to find out what kind of fighter I am. Just answer, I love it. But I want to talk to the American people about our common aspirations, our common purpose, and we need to get back to a Let, common Let's get cause. to guns. And I, I'm so impressed with your 14 point bill. The simplicity, like, let's make it as difficult as getting a driver's license. What I've never understood is during times when we're under, we've been through a terrorist attack, it becomes, or a pending one, it becomes the number one or number two voter issue. Yes. I could go on the theory that basically every day with guns, we're one day away from a gun attack, the same thing. So why does it not rise up to one of the top tipping points, what voters care about? How do you take it, take this amazing program, and I salute you, and really make it a front and center issue for voters? Well, you know, look, I come at this in a very personal way, to be honest with you, because these mass shootings that happen with uh, chilling regularity in America, you live in a community like mine, last week I had two guys shot in my neighborhood. I had a guy killed with an assault weapon on my block. I'm probably the only person in Congress, or at least in the Senate, that's had that happen. Um, we live in a nation right now where gun violence is going up, but for black guys in America who are 6% of the nation's population, over 50% of the homicides are in communities like mine of people that, that look like me. Um, I, I'm not waiting on this issue. I, the gun lobby, the corporate gun lobby has controlled this debate in insidious ways that most Americans don't know. Any of the consumer products you have before you, your phone, your, your eyeglass, if they blow up and scratch your eye or something, you actually can have, sue them for negligence. The one industry that's been able to exempt themselves is the corporate gun lobby. They've, they've exempted themselves from, uh, found ways to undermine CDC studying the issue. The ATF is one of the most anemic law enforcement divisions we have in America because they keep them weak because they don't want to enforce the laws that we have. So what I believe is that we can fight this fight differently. And if a guy who sees shrines for kids on his, in his neighborhood who've died on the streets, who's seen too many damn funerals, who literally was there trying to stop a kid from bleeding to death, who was shot in the chest, uh, I'm done with this. They are not going to frame the debate. I'm going to bring a fight like they've never seen before. Good for you. Last question. In polls, you're at 2%, 4%. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there's a couple of folks up top and a bunch of guys in the middle. Strategy now. Guys yeah. are bringing me. And I say, Senator, we need, not that we need, I would suggest a law, a, I don't say Hail Mary, something out of the box, that the simple blocking and tackling at this point, because you're up against what I call the media, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy of economies of scale. The guys yes. at the top get more media, and, yeah, and that's yeah. the way Trump got elected. Yeah. So I say to you, we, we, I want a long ball. I want a, I want a Statue of Liberty play, all right? What is it? I'm going to put my, my playbook right on the, on the record because it's not that complicated. Uh, nobody polling this early, this far out, has won the Democratic nomination with the exception of 16 when Hillary Clinton was running. But everybody else. How'd that work out? Was a, exactly. Everybody else was a surprise. Obama was polling behind with African Americans in this country until he won an upset in Iowa. John Kerry was polling at 4% before Iowa. You beat, you win this game by organizing on the ground. How I beat a machine in Newark by getting out there, as you said, with charisma, with connection, connecting with voters, with giving them something to stand up for, for fight for, that's more aspirational than just going low and punching somebody in the face. We're gonna win this game by out organizing people. I'm the best retail person in this. I've proven it uh, by upsetting elections. People told me all my career, the things I couldn't do, we did them. And we're gonna do that in Iowa, New Hampshire, and come around going down south uh, in the lead. A few. One more question I, I yeah. ask Mayor Pete, I'm ask every candidate, because I think we're formed by the most difficult things that happened to us as a kid, embarrassing kids. Yeah. Give me the thing that has stuck with you 
It could be with girls, it could be in sports, it could be in front of a classroom, where you felt embarrassed and humiliated as a kid, and it's kind of stuck with you. I've, I've got mine. The, the audience is not interested. Oh, my, my most embarrassing experience, seventh grade, I was terrified about speaking in front of crowds. And uh, my first speech ever running for president of something was president of the seventh grade class in Harrington Park Elementary, and I froze. I couldn't get a word out. Judd Toohey, this young, great young guy, was my vice presidential candidate. Was like, "What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you?" It was my, it was my greatest fear at that point, growing up in my adolescence. And I decided that night when I was home with my head in my pillow uh, that I was going to turn my greatest weakness, my greatest fear, into a strength. Right. Senator Brooker, thanks for your time. Good Thank luck you. in the campaign. Thank you so much. And still ahead, we get apolitical, where we talk to A-listers outside of the world of politics about politics. Tonight, the Bucks stop here. Mark Lazary, the billionaire co-owner of the Milwaukee Bucks, joins me to talk about sports, taxes, and how he uses his franchise to make a statement about the state of our country. But first, I've known Donald Trump for years. We've done business together and appear on each other's TV shows. And back in 07, I sat down with Donald from my CNBC show, The Big Idea, and he was just as humble back then. Take a look. Your biggest mistake, your biggest, I cannot believe I did that. I would say this, um, I, I don't like to say mistake, I don't even like to admit that I make mistakes. You want to know the truth, because you know, it's sort of the power of positive thinking. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.